Jennifer, uh, in the series of Atomic Voices. Um, this um, the series was started by um, the Project on Managing the Atom with uh, the initiative of our fellows uh, two years ago, actually, uh, in response to some of the, the very necessary and, and rather uh, painful introspection that this entire nation actually globally, uh, but also our nuclear field has been going through in terms of uh, paying better um, attention to the issues of diversity um, and justice and equity. Um, so we have conducted already a, a series of seminars. You can find them on our website. And this one is our uh, first seminar uh, this year. As you uh, were able to tell from the uh, from the title, it is focusing on the teaching of nuclear topics, nuclear subjects. How do we develop um, syllabi in a way that takes account of this diversity of voices and perspectives in the field? What kind of narratives uh, do we want to communicate? How do we uh, deal with the texts that were uh, traditionally, you know, the, these this canon, these these very this this kind of almost I don't want to say dogma, but these very classical texts that are highly revered and that we need to learn to reread uh, perhaps in a more critical way. And um, with me today to discuss these issues um, are is an incredible lineup of speakers and I'm very thankful to all of you for finding the time to join us today. Um, and I will introduce them very briefly. You will find their full um, or the more expanded bio, uh, bios, uh, again, on our website. Um, but just to, to give you um, a sense of, of, of the kind of scope of expertise and also perspectives that we have here today, we are pleased to welcome Anne Harrington, uh, who's uh, an associate professor uh, at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Cardiff University in Wales. Um, and she, she held numerous fellowships and, uh, and has, is, is pu widely published and is, uh, is a very accomplished and interesting scholar in her own right. But she also, uh, and her research is focused on nuclear nonproliferation, deterrence and disarmament. Uh, but she is also a co-founder of Highly Enriched, which is, um, which is a platform, an online platform for teaching resources on nuclear issues that has uh, has coped and or has dealt in, and it exactly is created for the kinds of um, kinds of with the kinds of issues in mind that we will be speaking uh, of today. Uh, we also welcome Rebecca Davis Gibbons, who's um, an assist, uh, assistant professor of political science at the University of Southern Maine. Uh, and she uh, she is one of, formerly one of our own. She was a, a fellow and an associate um, at the project on managing the atom. Uh, her book, uh, The Hegemon's Toolkit, just came out. It's it's uh, uh, it's very highly regarded, and please please go and look it up. Um, and uh, uh, they we're also very very pleased to, uh, to welcome David Holloway, of, um, who is a um, Raymond's Spruance, I'm sorry, professor of international history and a professor of history and political science. Um, at the Stanford University. Uh, he has, uh, he is emeritus, is uh, recently retired, but he is still working uh, on, on the book on, on the international history of nuclear weapons currently. Um, and he's, he's a, a preeminent authority on the Soviet nuclear program. Everyone in the fields knows his classical book, Stalin, Stalin and the Bomb. But of course uh, he has contributed greatly uh, greatly to our field, and we're very fortunate uh, to have him join us today. Uh, and last but certainly not the least is Kartika Sasi Kumar, who is um, uh, who is a professor. Uh, sorry, um, um, who is a professor of political science at the San Jose State University. She is also a formerly one of our own. Uh, she is. A, she was a fellow um, at the project on managing uh, the atom. Uh, she uh, has researched and taught widely in 
uh, in our field um, and has 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 a lot of excellent scholarship that I know I have consulted also in in my own work on international regimes and international norms in the nuclear field. So uh, without further ado, um, I will ask um, uh, I will ask Rebecca to go first. I have asked all of our participants to prepare just a set of of reflections and remarks on the topic. And then I will uh, follow on uh, with, with perhaps a question or two, and then we'll open up this discussion to the audience. Please post your questions in, in the Q&A box, and then I will be able to grab them from there uh, and post them to our panelists. This is a recorded seminar, just, just a word of housekeeping before we go on. Uh, it will be later available on our website and, and transcribed. Um, so, so please keep that in mind when we're also presenting and, and asking questions. Um, and with that, Rebecca, please, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for the introduction. Thank you um, to Managing the Atom for holding this event. I think it's really important to have this discussion. And I think I want to say from the outset that I am still learning and I, I am still worried about saying the wrong things in these discussions. And so I'm going to try to be very honest, but I just want to acknowledge that these can be difficult topics to discuss, um, but that we need to discuss them. And that can't be an obstacle to having these discussions. And so I would say in the past few years, as issues of diversity and inclusion have come to greater awareness uh, amongst the population and also in, in higher education, I have tried to change my, what I teach, my readings, my syllabus, um, to reflect that and to have greater mindfulness about, about some of these topics. And I do teach nuclear issues, but I'm also an international relations professor. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about that because I think most of us don't get to just talk nuclear weapons all the time or nuclear nonproliferation all the time. We, we teach other classes. And so I found in terms of content, the first place that it's been um, easiest for me to bring in different perspectives and, and look through um, the lens of race, for example, as we're talking about history, has been in my intro to international relations class. So for example, we talk about the racialized ideas uh, that Woodrow Wilson had in thinking about whether the US should enter the war and this real hand-wringing about the fact that the, the, the continent of Europe and this civilized uh, world we're, we're going to war and that the U.S. should stay out because it shouldn't be another civilized country joining this war. And so we talk about that, you know, race had uh, was was really important. And that's actually World War One is where the discipline of international relations was started out of the idea that we can never let this happen again. So we need to study war and peace. Um, I think the first chair of a um, international relations department was, was funded out of the idea that we have to prevent the great war from happening again. Um, in my syllabi, in my, um, I have tried to incorporate greater diversity of perspectives. I think as a woman in international security, I long uh, was, was aware of kind of gender imbalances in, in, in my um, syllabus, but less so, I wasn't quite as good at bringing in say non-Western perspectives. And so that's something I've, I've tried really hard to do um, in my, in, in, again, in international relations, when we talk sovereignty, I spent a lot of time talking sovereignty from the perspective of Native Americans and thinking about what land that we're on and the treaties that the early um, American nations signed with Native American tribes in order to bolster and legitimize itself as a nation. Um, and that I think sort of blows students minds when you talk about that there are treaties that allow if you're not if you're not a native, if you're not native uh, to this continent, then there are treaties that are sort of allowing you to be here that were signed so long ago and that's not a perspective that I think students generally have and so we look about we look at where we live and what that means and and think about different conceptions of sovereignty and how a certain conception of sovereignty changed the culture um, culture for Native Americans. And so that, that's an intro to international relations. Um, for my courses related to nuclear weapons, I had a little bit of a head start in thinking about this and really thinking about different perspectives on nuclear weapons because, of, um, because I was really fortunate after college to live for a year and teach elementary school amongst the bikini community. So I 
lived in the Marshall Islands, and I was teaching on the island of Kili, which is a, quite a small coral island where a portion of um, those from who originally were from Bikini Atoll live now. And so that experience allowed me to see firsthand how nuclear testing can really affect communities and culture. Um, the Bikini people were known as some of the best sailors in the Pacific. Um, the, you know, there were certain foods that were eaten and then Keeley today is not like that at all in terms of relying on the United States for food. It's not very conducive. People do it, but it's not as conducive to, to fishing and sailing. And so that perspective is one I always try to bring into my classes on nuclear weapons and what has what that meant um, for that community and for their culture. Um, and as a result, I also like to bring in various other perspectives into the class. We always read um, poetry from those who experienced uh, the detonation in detonations in um, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, other poetry by those affected, very powerful poetry by those affected by testing in the Pacific. Uh, we do research on the various groups that were affected both by uranium mining and nuclear testing. Um, and so I have also been more motivated to do that, I think, because of my study of the humanitarian initiative that eventually led to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, where one thing that I really appreciate about that initiative is they expanded the idea of who has expertise in the nuclear field by bringing those who are from Kazakhstan or uh, Australia or the Pacific or Algeria or the Western United States, all places where nuclear uh, weapons tested testing happened and let them discuss how it's affected their, uh, their lives or from Japan. And so I, I like that idea of like, you don't, you don't have to have a PhD in political science to be an expert in, in kind of what nuclear weapons can do and how they can affect people. And so I've tried to bring that into the classroom. And I'd say for the most part, my students seem really interested in bringing the perspectives into class. Uh, for their research assignments this past spring, I had two different groups that chose to examine the role of race in nuclear testing for their semester long project. Um, although I'd say I still sense this like strong discomfort with the topic. And like I said, from the outset, this, this fear of saying or doing something wrong or not being sensitive because it, it's coming, it's from a good place, right? It's from a desire um, to, to better understand these issues. Um, and it's certainly nothing that I really talked about that much in my graduate school experience. So, so it is new. Um, I think I've talked for a while, so I think I will pass it on to someone else, but I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was uh, that was really um, insightful to to sort of uh, hear your journey, uh, learn about your journey, how you come, coming from your graduate student experience, try to reformulate it for your own uh, students. Um, I will ask then, um, Kartika, maybe you could go next to uh, to kind of share your experience of teaching, but also, you know, the the, the perspectives um uh perhaps you know is hoping a a, a non-western perspective that could help us uh, look at these issues and the, and the nuclear syllabus in a different way sure okay thank you mariana and welcome everybody um i want to add a little bit to uh, the introduction a very nice introduction that mariana gave uh, not so much about myself but about uh, where i teach because i think that's relevant to what i'll say today um, so I teach at uh, San Jose State University, which is the flagship campus of the California State University System, which is the largest university system in the United States. We have 33,000 students, and um, out of these, about 200 are political science majors. So majors means that in the last two years of their four-year undergraduate degree, they are mainly taking political science classes, and I teach um, a seminar on nuclear weapons. I teach international security, which is the class that I'm teaching at the moment. Um, and then I teach uh, one or two comparative politics classes as well. Um, my students um, are, uh, so San Jose State students are 35% Asian, 28% Hispanic, and about 15% white. Um, and about 40% uh, of them are first generation. So the first in their families to go to college and roughly half of them are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. So we are very diverse and we are really the face of what America is going to look like in the future. OK, um, so Atomic Voices, the project that uh, we are all part of today, 
aims to critically rethink the kind of questions that um, we ask in the nuclear field and the voices that get heard. So what um, kinds of things do we learn from listening to students and those who teach them? Um, so I commend the organizers for focusing on teaching because um, you know, when we're talking about diversity and hierarchies, um, there is a hierarchy in our profession, which is that research is privileged over teaching, right? Um, so when we listen to students, um, the first thing that I learned is that nuclear weapons and certainly theorizing about nuclear weapons is not one of their top concerns. So that was very humbling, right? Though I have to say that the last seven months uh, though dangerous for world peace have been quite useful for making the public and my students, um, you know, sensitized to the fact that nuclear danger is, is still with us. Um, so what can we do about this as educators? Um, and I think that we should try to make connections between uh, environmental and social justice and nu the nuclear complex. Um, and similar to what Rebecca just shared with us about her teaching, because these are issues that the students are, at least my students are very concerned about. And so, you know, drawing the connections between the harms that the nuclear weapons complex uh, does to humanity and um, other uh, sort of big government um, issues. And, you know, there's, there's been a lot of research done on this, so I won't belabor the point. Um, the second point that I'll make is uh, the need for new texts or new classics. So I want to give a shout out to Rebecca's project um, to create um, uh, new classics, I think is the term that they use. And maybe she can talk more about that in, in the Q&A. Um, but I want to make a sort of related point that we must look beyond the definition of text as print on paper. We must meet young people where they are. And whether they're at Harvard or Stanford or San Jose State, they are not consuming large chunks of printed material. Um, so we need to find audio and visual material. Um, and here I wanna mention Anne's excellent work uh, with Enriched uh, for creating uh, games and simulations that one can use. Um, I have uh, been creating my own simulations uh, for my classes that I create new uh, new ones every semester. And um, I, do, I do this for many reasons, but one of the main reasons, honestly, is that I want to uh, tool them to the strengths and weaknesses of my own students, because I know them very well. I have small classes, so I have the luxury of doing that. But also to prevent cheating, which is a really big problem now with, with online classes. Um, so I, I'm, but also it's fun for me to make them. So I, I do a new one every, every time. Uh, but I want to also suggest the work of um, Eric Schlosser and Adam Higginbotham on, on Chernobyl um, and the movie, I forget the name of the director, but um, The Man That Saved the World. I mean, these are all really excellent resources that I've used in, in teaching. So basically moving away from sort of the printed text. Um, in uh, another thing I want to point out about texts, which is again, a very, maybe a very banal point, but I come up against this brute force, which is the paywall, right? So I teach at a university that's not very well resourced. And so I have to look for open educational resources or as we call them OER. And that has forced me to look for um, fresh perspectives. And this has, um, in fact, I think improved my teaching because it's forced me to look beyond the canon um, such as it is. Um, one additional point, because Mariana requested me to bring in a non-Western perspective. We can talk all we want about diversity, but um, the scholars and students in non-Western countries cannot access uh, knowledge, they cannot access knowledge that is sometimes produced by them and that is about them because of the paywalls that are erected by publishers in rich countries. So there are um, many articles that are written by scholars in Western countries that are based upon interviews and fieldwork that are done in countries like um, 
like uh, you know like Kazakhstan like India and Pakistan and scholars in those countries cannot even read them because of the paywall so I urge those of you that have any influence in these matters um, to be very mindful of where you publish and how you publish and to choose open access whenever possible. So the very last thing that I'll say is obviously about content. So just try and bring it back to the issue of content and the issue of new classics. So right now, after this, I'm going to teach my International Security Pauls 157 class. And on the menu today is Kenneth Waltz's article, Why Iran Should Get the Bomb, and also Carol Cohn and Sarah Riddick's review article on feminist perspectives on nuclear weapons, because this is what we're talking about this week. Um, so we're talking about nuclear deterrence, obviously. But we need new texts that address the fact that while in the first two to three decades after the bomb, the problem that everyone was addressing was how do we deal with those that haven't learned how to play the game of deterrence or those who don't want to play the game, say like rogue states or nuclear or, or terrorists. But in the last two to three days, as my students are going to ask me, uh, the country that's threatening is the one that is supposed to have kept the Cold War cold. Um, and the country that's supposed to be one of the responsible states uh, that plays the game of nuclear deterrence. So how do we deal with that? How do we create knowledge or you know, peer reviewed uh, knowledge that I can assign um, that my students can grapple with this? So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kartika. I think not only your students, we all have been grappling with this with this predicament uh, where uh, I don't think we have good text to, to try and help us understand and explain exactly what's going on in, in the past uh, seven months. Um, with that, um, David, if you could uh, uh, if you could go next and and sort of share with us kind of this journey that you have traveled through the field for for many years and the and the, the experience you have had um, such a rich experience of teaching um, and all the students that have been through your classroom, uh, how do you see this field has shifted, changed? Uh, what are some of the new threats and opportunities, as it were, that we're facing? Okay, thanks, Mariana. <laughs> um, uh, when I got the invitation to take part, yes, I re recalled that the first uh, course on nuclear weapons that I taught was in 1968-69. Um, so, uh, and I co-taught co it as a seminar uh, at the University of Lancaster with uh, Colin Gray. Um, who uh, later went on to be, uh, write a great deal about uh, strategy, strategy and nuclear weapons. And the way we framed it was in the terms that were popular at the time as a course about an arms race. And, you know, what, what did we know about arms races as a category? And what could one... Um, say about the arms race that we were in the middle of uh, at that time. Um, I thought that for one year, we both left uh, Lancaster um, at the end of that year. And um, I didn't teach anything else on nuclear weapons until I came to Stanford in the, in the mid eighties. And since then I have taught various courses, um, seminars, uh, with Bart Bernstein on kind of history and theory uh, of nuclear weapons, um, a seminar on the science, technology, history and politics of uh, ballistic missile defense with Ted Postal. Um, I um, taught over the last years, I haven't taught a, a class now in, since 2018, but the uh, in my last years of teaching courses, um, I taught a course on interna the international history of nuclear weapons, because that's what I was writing about and thinking about. And uh, I was also involved um, in the nuclear history boot camp for uh, 
10 years, I guess, uh, co-teaching with various people, uh, actually, especially Marty Show, and we, we most often shared um, our sessions. So the field has changed just enormously. Um, there's just no question. Um, and I think it's just, there's so much more material, so many more, doc well, first of all, there's a longer history, <laughs> it's 50 years added to, um, you know, 23 years after the bomb, something like that. And um, there's a huge amount of scholarship. So, and I think of this my own, just because I had studied Russian, I became interested in trying to understand the Soviet side of the uh, nuclear, well, arms race or Soviet nuclear policy. Um, I think I, in the late 80s, Mac George Bundy wrote a book called Danger and Survival, which I, he conceived of as um, the kind of international history of deterrence. But if you look at the book, it's of course, basically about the US because that's what he knew intimately, but also because there was so very little about the Soviet Union that you could, you could draw on. And um, that's not the case now. And it's not the case for India, where there's a considerable literature about Indian nuclear politics and policy and programs and so on. So I think there's been a transformation of the scholarship that's available, um, historical uh, and political science uh, scholarship and that I think has broadened um, the range of topics that are possible now that uh, would not have been possible before. I should say I didn't, um, I began to focus on writing about uh, nuclear issues uh, under the encouragement of Margaret Gowing, who was the professor of the history of science at Oxford and the official historian of the British um, Atomic Project. Um, and it was she, I was daunted by the prospect of getting into uh, deal with nuclear issues and having to, if I was going to write, uh, having to write in the way she did with some detailed understanding of the science and the technology and the government institutions. Um, and I was, but she kind of pressed me to do that. I'm, and I'm very grateful to her. Uh, for that. Um, but uh, so, but more recently, yes, uh, probably in the last 10 or 12 years has been the time I've been most interested in the teaching of um, to do with nuclear weapons. And I would just say one, yes, there are, there is a, a a canon, if you like, when you think about nuclear weapons in international relations and the works produced in, in the US uh, in the 1950s, mainly. And it, it's a canon, not only because, of course, people refer to it and treat the literature as canonical, uh, but also because it's been very influential and it's very influential in the Soviet Union, for example. I mean, they read and um, uh, the literature that we think of, I mean, Brody and uh, the Kissinger early work, uh, Osgood, Herman Kahn, and so on. And they, in those writings influenced Soviet thinking. So there's a sense in which you can't ignore a canon if it's had a big impact on the way people think. And I think uh, you, Mariana, mentioned uh, the rereading of the canon. And that's really the important point, I think, is the reinterpretation, rereading rather than um, neglect, because at least if one is interested in, a, in, in the history of the influence of ideas, then I think one has to pay attention to the, the canon. It doesn't mean uh, an uncritical attention. Um, so in my teaching, I think the one thing uh, I've tried to always stress is that these are serious issues. It, that the interest is not in the, as were the modeling, the interest is really in the weapons and the damage they can do. That this is not just some policy area, it's a policy area with uh, huge implications for, for the human race. And um, that um, engagement by students has changed over time. I think in recent years, 
um, people thought, well, the nuclear issue, it's, it's not on the forefront. It's not what really concerns us now. But if I remember back to the early 1980s, it really was what concerned people. People were very anxious indeed about uh, the prospect of uh, nuclear war. And I think, uh, though I've not been teaching the classes, uh, that it has come to the fore in the last uh, seven months since the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine and the kind of nuclear saber rattling, <laughs> the phrase, the rather odd phrase that people use um, to describe what's been happening. Um, and that I, so that's the one thing I've really, I think, always taken as a, 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 a constant. Um, and I guess my, focus on diversity has really been to try to draw in the Soviet side of this history. That's been the main focus of my research, uh, because I think that's also important. Um, the literature is dominated by the US. The, the, the theoretical literature that's influential is mainly the US literature. Um, and um, I think for that very reason, uh, one needs to try to understand the other actors in the nuclear world as actors and as agents, not merely as um, subjects or recipients of others' influence. The, just two final points briefly. I think now one can imagine a whole range of different courses about to do with nuclear issues. There's I guess the most traditional one is to do with um, nuclear weapons, war and peace. I mean, coming from international relations, uh, but uh, certainly on uh, nuclear testing and colonialism or uh, treatment of ethnic minorities, that's something now that can be done across a range of different um, countries and programs. Um, there are issues to do with, um, you know, nuclear power and nuclear weapons, um, and also the nuclear. The, this nuclear discourse is, in many ways, is very inward-looking. So I think there are possibilities of thinking about um, the nuclear danger in relation to other global threats. And I don't. I mean, there is some of that work going on, but that's another area: climate change, for example pandemics, uh, energy, whatever, because after all, there's been an effort to deal with the nuclear danger, however one evaluates the effort, um, and that may have lessons to be um, learned. But I think, you know, when we approach nuclear weapons, we approach it from some disciplinary point of view. I mean, Rebecca mentioned IR. Yes, that's one classical way. One can do it as history and history of different kinds, including history of science. STS has had a big influence, I think, on the way uh, people think about uh, nuclear weapons. Sometimes a very strong influence, or sometimes a rather kind of uh, weaker, but nevertheless pervasive sense uh, of one, one doesn't ask just what is the impact of nuclear weapons on international relations? Because one has to think, what's the impact of international relations on nuclear weapons? It's not, um, the technology isn't just, uh, as it were, a given. Uh, psychology. Um, uh, so there are different ways of thinking about uh, teaching about um, nuclear weapons or nuclear issues. And I think the question I have in my mind, it, is there just one thing? Is there nuclear studies, is that one thing? Or is it just different things when viewed from uh, different uh, disciplinary perspectives? So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, there's a lot to ponder. And now that I was uh, listening to you, David, I think what Maybe after um, Anne uh, completes her, you know, delivers and completes her remarks, I'll ask, uh, I'll go back and I'll ask each one of you to maybe reflect on some of the things that you've heard from others presenting 
because I see a lot of nodding heads um, and, and kind of pondering faces. And I think it'd be interesting to hear how we all sort of react to, to each other's remarks. And um, But not before we hear from Anne and, and her, um, you know, you bring it all <laughs> together for us as, if possible. And um, also tell us more about this highly enriched uh, uh, project that, that sounds very necessary and very cool. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mariana, for the invitation. And it's always lovely to see Rebecca and Karthika and David. Um, I'm very honored to be on a panel with all of you. Uh, so when I'm listening to everyone else's comments, um, I'm hearing that there's different ways that we think about um, bringing diversity to the table in teaching. And one is the idea of where are we sourcing the materials and who are we, um, whose stories are we telling when we're choosing what to assign? And um, that was, I think Rebecca talked about that in particular when she talked about um, teaching on the experiences of um, people in the Pacific, right? And how that differs, how their lived experience gives a different experience of what, what nuclear weapons mean to communities and populations. And then Karthika um, talked a lot about um, diversity in terms of who we're teaching, um, who are we speaking to as teachers. And then um, I think that there's also the question of diversity in terms of to what end are we doing our teaching? And um, that's something that I concern myself with a lot because I live a kind of um, sort of hybrid life in the sense that I'm married to a senior military officer. And I also spend a lot of time writing about diversity in the military and talking to a lot of people who work in the nuclear enterprise in the United States Air Force. Um, and at the same time, I teach at a university in the United Kingdom where the predominant um, approach to international relations within the dep department I teach in is a feminist one. And in particular, it's a feminist one that challenges um, even the idea that we should be teaching the canon at all. It's, it, it's challenging the notion that that is something that is a relevant thing to teach to our students, right? So if you take feminist international relations courses at Cardiff University, you're not going to learn who Tom Schelling is, right? Um, and so I frequently feel as though I'm, you know, the most radical person in my US context in terms of my points of view and the most conservative person in my UK context um, in terms of my points of view. And when I look at this question of teaching to what end, um, I always struggle with the idea that you have a limited amount of time with any one student in the classroom and you have to choose what to share with them. And if you want to teach people what they need to know in order to be um, seen as an expert within the nuclear enterprise, it doesn't really matter whether it's in the UK or the US a nuclear weapon state or even really a non-nuclear weapon state. Uh, they need to be able to, I think, address and respond to uh, the canon, right? They need to be able to understand what those comments are. You don't want them to be hearing about um, mutual assured destruction or some of these really core second strike capability. You want them to be fluent in that language before they go out in the field. Um, but at the same time, and I think that's true, whether you conceive of the field narrowly as being the nuclear enterprise in the sense of um, uh, working for either a national agency or an international um, um, organization that um, is part of either the nonproliferation structure, or the deterrence structure, or working in the advocacy side of things in terms of pushing back on those things. Um, I recently had a conversation with um, someone who teaches in the um, Strategic and Nuclear Deterrence Program, SANS program um, for the US Air Force. And she wanted to talk to me. Um, we had a fantastic conversation, but she wanted to talk to me about what to assign so that she could effectively teach nuclear um, officers working on these things to think critically about how to respond to the arguments from the disarmament 
community, right? Which is a whole different way of thinking about why we're teaching diversity of perspective, right? But that to me says a lot about um, how important those views are being taken if people are thinking about how do I incorporate that, right? And looking for that as a resource. Um, and then there's also just the kind of broader question of uh, many of the students that we teach are never going to do anything with the nuclear field at all, but they need to be informed citizens, right? Especially when you are living in democracies where people are voting and making decisions about what, are, what these enterprises look like. And one of the things that concerns me about this stuff is, um, I'll tell you a quick story about, I was working on Capitol Hill for a while and um, I was working for a senator. And in the evening I was teaching at George Mason University. And I was doing that because I wanted to get an academic job and I needed to maintain my teaching credentials. So I would go out there in the evenings and the thing about teaching in that master's program is that you get staffers, young staffers who are looking to get their master's degree coming and taking classes from you. So I was a staffer for Senator Gillibrand and it was at the time that um, things were um, heating up with the Iran deal. It was before it had been, um, the JCPOA had been completed. And uh, I had a staffer from, it was um, Senator Mark Kirk from Illinois, who was famously very conservative on all these issues in my class. And I'm, I like to teach my preferred kind of slice of how I teach these things is I like to teach classes on that I would call nuclear threats and the control of fissile materials. Um, so I like to teach classes that combine some of the core principles of deterrence along with this non-proliferation structure and the reasons that the, the non-proliferation structure exists. And so I realized that this guy is, you know, in the Senator's office, helping to advise on these issues, he doesn't know that there's an IAEA. He doesn't know that there is a non-proliferation treaty. He doesn't know that there are inspections, right? He has an extraordinarily right-leaning perspective on bombing Iran. And yet he has, it's as if all of these things out in the world, um, just don't exist for him because they aren't part of the discourse in his day-to-day -day circles. And he also, you know, in his portfolio has a lot of things he's looking at, not just that thing, right? But there's also this thing of, you know, he happens to be placed in an influ in influential position even at a young age. But there's also just this thing of, if we don't tell people these things exist, how do they learn them? right? How, if that doesn't become encompassed within our teaching. Um, so uh, I think in, there's a, a sort of um, trajectory in political science um, in terms of how we think disciplinarily um, about what we teach. And it starts with the fact that as, um, you know, and here I'm going to start repeating some of the things that um, David Holloway said. <laughs> um, it starts with the fact that many of these core concepts come to light in the 1950s and the canon comes from this place, but that place is a place that's constrained by the assumption of a rational actor, right? The person at the center of that is identityless, and they are... Um, there, the, it's it's almost as if it's the opposite of a diverse perspective. It's one universal perspective, and then that one universal perspective, as David already shared, gets um, uh, it starts to travel, right? It starts to become influential in many different places around the world, right? And it is very, um, it's very ahistorical, but it's ahistorical almost by necessity, almost because nuclear weapons are so new and they challenge so much of what we already know, there's this um, way in which those ideas are so seductive because we need to believe that things are gonna be different, right? The historical truth that had come out of the world wars where arms races were dangerous, um, that they could lead to war. And if that was the case, then we were doomed to have World War III. And here, these assumptions about the rational actor and the system of deterrence that's built on that suddenly tell us, no, it's, you know, it's going to be okay. And I think some of the seductive that, uh, seductiveness of that continues to operate, you know, even as I teach it to my students, I see that continues to operate on people. 
even as we now have, uh, we now have um, 75 years of ex experience in history. It's no longer a, a historical field, right? We have a whole swath of work. And really, I would say only, I mean, David knows more than I do about this, but it's really in the last decade or so that a lot of the, the historical work has sort of opened up in terms of, you know, the Cold War ended and now all of a sudden we're getting to hear more of the stories of the programs that didn't come to be in various places or, you know, the, the variety of the historical stories um, have started to be written. Um, and so to go back then to look at this question of um, what it means to problematize the rational actor by historicizing the field, you can also, as Rebecca has already mentioned, connect that up with the notion that we also can look at the ways that having an objective point of view as you know, um, one way of doing that is the rational actor also hides the way in which racialized assumptions have shaped the discipline of international relations. Um, so one of the books that I teach with frequently, um, which is, uh, it's not an easy book to teach to undergrads, um, but I frequently teach with Robert Vitalis's White World Order and Black Power Politics, because he also has a shorter um, article version of that because it uh, talks about how the field itself is born in this moment of transition from a colonial world order that is explicitly racialized to a world order in which colonial structures are um, uh, kind of reimposed in a non-racialized fashion. And you can teach the history of nuclear of the nuclear order in that way, right? There's a way that you can draw these connections. He doesn't do that in the book, um, but it's a book that I use in order to make that leap because it's also historicizing the field itself in a broader fashion, the field of international relations. Um, and I think the reason to do that is that there's, it, there is a, um, a way in which the field reproduces itself unintentionally in a constrained way where it's marginalizing to um, people of color in ways in which you know, I am largely unaware or other people are largely unaware. But if we create the opportunity for people to see themselves in what we're teaching, you open up the possibility of them feeling more inspired to bring their own energy to the field. And I think what you end up with then is a larger group and population of people who don't need to be taught about diversity because they, they, they live it, right? Um, they bring that knowledge to the study to the field in a way that other popular, you know, that, that I don't do as effectively, for instance. Um, and you're starting to see groups emerge um, in, in the nuclear field in the, in the sense of the people who work in the enterprise, right? Um, like Bonnie Jenkins initiative, the WCAPS. Um, so I'm gonna close with saying that um, there's a couple of different reasons that I started Highly Enriched. Uh, one is that I 100% what Karthika is saying about how do you reach people who aren't going to sit down and read articles that are 30 pages long. A lot of it was this idea of part of the way you reach them is by diverse, diversifying the way your resources get handed out. And it felt like I can ask my friends because I'm well connected what resources they're using and they're gonna share them with me. But how do I do that for um, people who may not be connected in the same way I am? And so crowdsourcing something and trying to keep it free and available is one way to do that. Um, the other piece of the website, Highly Enriched, so just so, so people know, the concept behind it is pretty simple. It's supposed to be a kind of like all recipe for teaching resources. Um, in the, in the classroom on nuclear issues. But we also decided in, 
to put a mentor portal there. It's um, right now still very highly representative of people who've worked in the DC nuclear space. But, you know, I had the great privilege of um, being at Stanford as a CSAC fellow with David. And one of the things about those kinds of environments is that you meet the people who are making the policy and have the opportunity to talk to them and interact with them and learn what their lives are like and make those connections. But those connections don't necessarily um, exist in the same way. I happen to be in Texas right now, you know, at Texas State University, San Marcos. So we included a mentor portal of people who are willing to give informational interviews and are willing to be contacted by the site. And that concept is have people invite these mentors into their classroom, give um, a, a lecture on things. Like, so we just signed up um, Shirley Johnson. She frequently lectures in my classes for me. She's an IAEA, retired IAEA EA inspector who was there on the field doing many of the things that we read about in the hist history books and gives a fantastic lecture on those things. And then is willing, you know, if you have people who want to find out what was it like, how did you get into this? What, you know, she's willing to follow up and, and have them ask her those kinds of questions. So the idea is to kind of try to create this synergistic experience where you're diversifying things and you're also opening up these networks to um, places that are maybe a little bit further from centers of of power. Um, and the last thing I will say is that um, I've been doing a um, plowshares project. I've just started it with Shampa Biswas on um, decolonizing the nuclear studies curriculum. Um, we're going to be putting together modules that are specifically aimed at these topics. Um, and as part of that process, we've been having a these conversations about pedagogy and these ideas of, I always start with the canon, but I've gotten a lot of challenge from that because people have said, no, if you start with the canon, the students identify with that thing that they learn first and it's very seductive. And then I go, I wanna go back and say, okay, and now everything I've taught you is limited and nuanced and not quite correct in all of these ways. And now I'm gonna introduce you to all of the ideas that push back on that. And um, I co-teach a course on, um, uh, we call it international nuclear politics um, with Campbell Craig at Cardiff University. And we co-teach this course and it drives towards these questions of how do you, how do you resolve the nuclear dilemma, right? And we present various options to them. And Campbell and I always kind of compete at the end to see, do students come away from this thinking that disarmament is possible, a nuclear disarmament or impossible, right? And Campbell has his own um, idiosyncratic take on all of this, but his answer is that it's not possible. And my answer is that it's possible. And then we read the students essays at the end <laughs> to find out, right? But he always starts by teaching the history and the and um, elements of, of the canon from the development of the US Soviet relationship. And then I come in um, with more of the STS inflected um, uh, arguments and the nuclear nonproliferation treaty. And I have to say that um, I always get one or two <laughs> out of a class of, of 60 or 70 students. I always get one or two who come along with me but the vast majority are, are profoundly swayed. And so I, I have been taking on board this idea of, does it matter um, in what order people get introduced to ideas? Um, does it matter pedagogically where you, where you begin? Um, not just uh, what you teach, but um, just thinking through the, kind of emotional experience for students of how you teach them these things. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share this. And thank you, this was um, this was super insightful. I, I've learned a lot from you, but it also raised a lot of interesting kind of uh, thoughts in my head and the, the um, you know, I haven't taught uh, much, but the one course I did uh, teach that I developed myself sort of took a creative license uh, in developing a nuclear issues. What I did was administer a quiz um, 
you know, just kind of like taking the temperature of where students are in the beginning and then had that same quiz at the end to see kind of the path uh, that the students have traveled. And I found that, you know, after 12 weeks of talking and teaching and, you know, all these different perspectives that I tried to convey, really that rational actor deterrence model was very seductive, right? That even those who were didn't know much about it or were skeptical at the beginning were like, mm. at the end found they sort of bought in, they, they drank the Kool-Aid or more have than uh, than previously. Um, and not, you know, not to, to make any value judgment on deterrence theory, but that was an interesting um, observation that I had. So I would like to uh, invite all of our um, audience members to please go ahead and start putting uh, their your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and while you're doing that or thinking through your questions, um, if, if any of you, Rebecca or Kartika or, or David, if you'd like uh, to, to reflect on anything that's been said so far, um, uh, please do so. Rebecca, do you? Yeah, I'll say a few All right, I love I, I loved listening to what everyone had to say and it spurred so many thoughts. But um Karthika's point about text and kind of how we privilege texts, I have I have tried to think about that in my class. I have a maybe a similar population. I have a lot of first gen, a lot of um either um immigrants or children of immigrants um in my classes. And I have, I do, in addition to teaching like a politics of nuclear weapons, I do teach WMD in the movies as a summer class, which I find is a way for students to get more interested in this topic, because as much as most of the movies are quite old and the special effects are terrible, like the day after when you just like see the skeletons and it, I mean, it's bad, but it, it does seem to grab their attention in a different way than just texts do. I'm hoping that the people who produce Chernobyl will do something similar for Hiroshima or Nagasaki to, so I can use that in my classes. Um, I do have the problem where Dr. Strangelove comes on and it's black and white and kids immediately think like boring. And so I've, I've struggled with that. But in general, I think that's a good way. And I do think there's a lack of I mean, the kind of articles that we're incentivized to write as scholars are not necessarily, are, are not the best articles for, for example, teaching undergrads. They're just not, right? So I, every, almost every year, someone emails me and says like, I need this as a basic text about the nonproliferation regime. And it's just, it's hard to find um, that kind of just basic information to assign to students without assigning these sort of articles that they find full of jargon that are too esoteric. Um, so I think that is a challenge. In terms of the canon, I would say because we are in this place where we're in a multipolar, I mean, we can debate about how multipolar we're in, the world is, but we're in this new era um, of multipolar uh, nuclear armed states. And, you know, the U.S. has to be concerned about Russia and China, and there's these other smaller nuclear weapon states. I think it's a really good time to remind students that the scholarship, the canon, ideas, the people who write them are fallible and it does, they were writing at a very specific time. I mean, that they're influenced by what's going on in their lives very much so. And so that it's okay. I think it's really hard for undergraduates and maybe for a lot of us to kind of look at Schelling or Wolstetter or these Brody or these classics and want and, and to, to feel even like that you have a right to critique them. But because we are in this kind of new historical period, and it's very different than the early Cold War. I think it's a good time to say, you know, do these assumptions still apply and to really question those assumptions and maybe students will be more open to that because I think my students love the idea of new, new ideas and new thoughts, right? So you're gonna take this theory and apply it to now and, and does it work? Or like, you know, you're, you're looking at this in a novel way. I think that gets students very excited about doing research. Um, and I'd also say, I think this connects to something some, some folks said, but connecting these issues, particularly nuclear disarmament to so social justice movements, connecting it to environmental movements, I think is a very important way to get people more interested in these ideas and probably um, I think is gonna be necessary to kind of increase the salience of nuclear issues in the population, which is very um, low right now. And I, I often do, um, a kind of a pre-quiz like you were saying but more just to see like what did you ever learn about these and like a little bit of Hiroshima Nagasaki but that's about all 
you know, the idea that they ended the war. So nothing about the revisionist history of the end of world war of the war in the Pacific. Um, anyway, I feel like I'm being a professor and just going on and on and I'll stop, but I just, I, I really enjoyed hearing what everyone else had to say. Good. Thanks, Rebecca. Kartika, would you, would you like to uh, re share some reflections? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. And thank you, everybody, for a very enriching uh, morning. Um, so I want to say a few things. I, I assume a lot of uh, people in the audience are, you know, either educators or are, are shortly to be educators. And so I want to um, talk about some practical things that might be helpful um, to them. And uh, so one of the things I want to say is that, you know, there's something very um, um, I think off-putting about um, the nuclear field, right? Which uh, certainly I felt as someone who was not um, trained in science and technology um, when I began to read about nuclear um, stuff. So it seems very sort of sophisticated and seems like, well, you know, I, I think David sort of mentioned this also, um, there seems to be this barrier to understanding um, the, uh, the physical processes that go into um, making the making of the bomb. Um, so one thing that I like to do is to give my students a sense of efficacy when, um, and uh, it's true when you give them a quiz at the start, um, and I do this sometimes too, not just in my nuclear weapons class, but even, you know, in um, other classes, just to an ungraded quiz to sort of gauge where they are, and the results are always horrifying. Um, and, you know, Anne pointed out that even staffers on Capitol Hill lack basic knowledge about, you know, the, the so, so I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm less and less horrified that my students who are, you know, as I pointed out, um, uh, first generation there in their families to go to college uh, don't have this knowledge. But what I then want to do is to, to explain to them that just because they don't have this knowledge doesn't mean that they don't have a sense of efficacy. And so I think simulations are a great way of doing this because they then get to play um, the, the roles of the leaders and I want to suggest, for example, and this is also responding to the question in the chat. Um, I don't know if everyone can see it, but there was a question about the NPT and um, Alex Wellerstein, who I think a lot of um, people here might know, um, actually designed this um, game slash simulation of the negotiation of the NPT itself. Um, and he's very generously made it available for free. He will actually send you the actual templates and the name cards and everything. You know, you just have to email them. Karthika, that's and all on Highly Enriched. Okay, great. So, so that's a, another easy way to find it. So basically, you know, I have them negotiate the NPT. And sometimes you get very random results, I have to tell you, but um, so, you know, so I tell them, okay, so you think the NPT is, this, you know, this artifact that's out there and, you know, you just have to learn about it. No, actually you can negotiate it, right? And so, um, and similarly, you know, you have an international crisis and you have them play the roles and this has two effects. One is it reminds them that the people that are negotiating the JCPOA right now, as we speak, are human beings just like them, but it also ex shows them that those people were also grappling this very complex set of circumstances, just like they are, right? So like Mario Rodrigo that they've known, you know, for four years now uh, is, is, you know, going, is someone that they're, you know, the Iranian counterpart might've known for four years. And so it's, it's actually a very humanizing, but at the same time, very useful reminder um, about what Rebecca was mentioning also that, you know, it, sort of like demystifying uh, these historical artifacts are just presented to us as always having uh, been there. And I also just want to mention in case people are a little confused about my background, I just realized that my uh, campus admin has created these new backgrounds. This is actually the Paseo, which is um, right in front of my office. And um, this is a, a mural of Mahatma Gandhi, and the reason it's on my uh, on the Paseo in my university is because uh, Cesar Chavez, who is from San Jose and was a leader of the farmers movement, um, was inspired by Gandhi. And so he's he's on the other side. I, I don't know. If I think my move my head. You can you can see Dolores Huerta was another sort of farmers movement person. So uh, where I work is very sort of imbued uh, with um, with. The history of social movements and so it's all the more important for me to link uh, what I do with that history um, and just talking about nuclear weapons and isolation is not going to work. Yeah thank you so much. Um, David would you would you take the floor for a bit? 
Yes, let me just uh, pick up on two things. One is on um, complementing texts with uh, visual uh, material. There is a lot of very good, uh, I mean, a number of extremely good movies, some of them in black and white, I'm afraid, um, dealing with nuclear issues. One that I think maybe not that well known, but is, is quite short and I think quite, um, actually quite terrifying, uh, is the, the War Game, which was made for the BBC in the 1960s. And when it was made, then um, the BBC wouldn't show it because it was too alarming. Um, uh, I, I, it certainly had, it was one of the things I think that got me interested in nuclear weapons because it was shown at universities. It just wasn't aired. Um, um, on, on, the, on, on the BBC. Um, and in, in my undergraduate uh, class, I would have um, as a way of not taking up the class time with showing movies, I would have a requirement that the students write a commentary on two different um, movies or documentaries out of a, a, a small group they could select. And I would just make sure those were available in the library or, or were available online. And that was a way to try to get people to, to use the other material. I think that was, that was quite successful, actually. Um, the second thing is um, uh, to pick up Anne's point about, you know, the, well, I think, um, everyone has made it about the kind of seductiveness of the what we think of as the canonical literature and how you how you how you teach it if this is what you teach first then it seems very elegant and you know thoughtful and so on um, and it, 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 the, the kind of counter arguments or flaws are not so evident so i'm finishing a book on on the inter, international history of nuclear weapons um, and uh, very self-consciously decided, I mean, a lot of political science will say, I'm going to test this theory. I want to see how this theory works in relation to a number of cases, let's say. Um, but I thought, no, the, actually the, the theories are part of the history. They're embedded in a history. They're not, uh, and I can deal with it that way. But of course, it then, it came to me that, yes, uh, it's not as simple as that. They're embedded in the history. So that actually means they already affect the way I'm thinking about these things and the way other people think about it. It's very difficult to separate out, as it were, the power of um, influential I ideas uh, and kind of put them <laughs> back in the box and say, I'm going to study them there and, and not let them affect the way in which I actually um, write about them. And um, so that's, I think that's a, a kind of tricky issue. And um, so one of the, the challenges I have is, is how one, as it were, deals with writing the history and the um, role of ideas or concepts or theories about, let's say about deterrence with that oneself being influenced in the way one writes about this whole um, language, which has, uh, which is hegemonic, uh, actually, in, the, in, in our field. And so that's, um, so there are tricky issues there. And uh, I think um, I'm, I mean, I have grappled with them as best I can. And no doubt, um, when the book is finished, uh, and published, um, see whether I've grappled with them successfully or not. Uh, yeah, it um, it really strikes me that you know it it would be you know in as much as possible teaching these canonical texts for for the lack of a better word, you know, signing them alongside um, you know if available uh, at all a text that puts them into the kind of historical kind of intellectual history as it were context in which they themselves were created 
would be very helpful. And, and, and in that, say, Benjamin Wilson's work on, on shelling and the intellectual history of that and how he brought all sorts of concepts from, from different disciplines into, the, into nuclear strategy, I think is a, um, is a very helpful way to, to exactly that, not to discard these texts as uh, you know, outdated, for instance, but to read them uh, and try to reinterpret them um, in that historical moment that they were. And there is a comment actually in the chat that says it's from Matthew Bunn, but I'm suspecting is from Francesca Giovannini, um, who's at Matt's account and says, but the quote unquote universal perspectives created in the 50s was not in fact universal. Um, it was shaped by a particular national, cultural, gender, racial, and other contexts, uh, while claiming uh, to to some sort of uh, universality, which is which is certainly right and some something we are um, discussing here. Um, and um, I was going to, um, since sort of uh, you perhaps had a chance to reflect on other comments in, in your last set of comments, but if not, uh, if there are other things that you'd like to pick up, um, not at the moment. So let's turn to some of the questions that we have um, in the Q&A uh, box here. One from Christopher Jones says, please comment on differences between teaching courses on national uh, nuclear strategy and courses on international arms control. And indeed, there seems to be sort of these, these either multilateralist kind of more towards disarmament and restraint kind of, kind of perspectives and more straightforwardly policy nuclear uh, strategy focused kind of domains. Um, how do we teach them, reconcile them? Uh, are they are they the kind of courses that kind of hone different people for different contexts? Do we silo people by by you know teaching one part, uh, but not the other? Um, anyone would like to uh, to take that on? I mean, I if I can start, or David, are you? Would you like to start? No, oh, why don't you start? Yeah. I'm just gonna say, I find this to be a real challenge because I want to have a comprehensive class and the way I teach it, it's the politics of nuclear weapons. And that could, that could mean a lot of different things, right? Um, but because of my area of interest, I do like to focus on non-proliferation. So I kind of start with a history of the nuclear age, cover some basic concepts like deterrence, MAD, second strike capabilities, um, but not, not in such a level of detail about like nuclear strategy. Then we kind of look at the theories of why countries want these weapons, and some of them fit in with those security strategies, and then look at non-proliferation, different means, and then like the end question is, is you know, disarmament both feasible and desirable? Um, but I, I, I feel that I always feel like, oh, did I shortchange my class if they took a nuclear class and I didn't talk like nuclear strategy? Um, but I am much more thinking about nuclear weapons role in international relations broadly and sort of what is the future of those and how human humanity is grappling or not grappling with this essentially existential threat that we have created but i think i think that's a real challenge and those probably should be two classes right yeah so the nuclear field i was just going to add is you know if we're we're just based on this conversation, we're saying there's so much more that could be, uh, you know, embraced in uh, under nuclear issues, right? The uh, the SDS perspectives, the psychology, you know, the history of it, and uh, we all are constrained by those twelve weeks or so that we have um, for teaching a course, um, uh, and that that is kind of a, a real challenge in teaching such a long history and such a complex set of issues. David, yeah, I'm. So I mean, I think I agree with um, Rebecca. I think one, uh, they are part of the same issue. The, 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 the question is, um, where did the nuclear weapons come from? You know, what drives the development of nuclear weapons? But also this is the great challenge and you get the different perspectives on it. So from one perspective is yes, um, you know, what if there is a nuclear war? What, what is nuclear strategy? What, what um, what kinds of uh, nuclear coercion are possible, uh, but also the effort to 
kind of constrain that and to make sure it, it doesn't get to the point of nuclear war. I mean, through uh, arms control, whatever you may think of the ideas, through stabilization of deterrence, through the non-proliferation treaty and so on. And that's all part of the same issue. And in the in, certainly I tried to deal with that in the course I was teaching on the international history of nuclear weapons. Is you could teach, of course, just on arms control so people would know you know, what the non-proliferation treaty is or what the different um, strategic arms um, control treaties have been. Uh, but that would be part of what is the bigger problem of, uh, Rebecca used the word grapple, and I think that's it. We're trying to grapple with something that's uh, a real existential threat. And that's what the history is, how we've, how we've tried to do that, how we've, um, or not try to do it, uh, what has been helpful, what has not been helpful, what and uh, Anne's question, what's ultimately possible? Um, you know, is, is disarmament possible or not? Or and if not, then what? <laughs> so I mean I think it's all one great um, set of interrelated issues. And it is very difficult to convey all of that. I mean, at Stanford we have 10 weeks, um, so we have to, you know, which strikes me as very, very little um, um, to, to cover something like that. And that makes for difficult choices. And, and it does, uh, and I think certainly undergraduate courses are for general education. People should, a citizen should know about this. People who want to be specialists, they can decide that and go on later for more specialist training. Um, graduate students or then postdocs or whatever. Um, but the, I think the ideal is the course that somehow manages to engage all the different dimensions in the problem. Indeed. Um, just, um, uh, I, Anne, I, uh, I see you're ready to comment, so you go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to respond to the question uh, in the uh, Q&A about whether students who, from different populations tend to um, react differently. Um, so I do, I do also teach a, a course on a regular basis to second year undergraduates called Gender, Sex, and Death in the rush, or gender, no, let me think. Um, I'm confusing uh, Carol Cohen's the, the title of her article um, with the title of our class, um, but it's like gender and sex and in international politics. And um, in that class, right? Like the way that you advertise the class kind of does scope who you get, right? So we do get a different um, sort of like there's a bell curve of students that are available to you and we do get a different slice of that in that class than in the international nuclear politics class and those students are much more open to ideas about challenging um, hegemonic interpretations of of what nuclear policy should be but it, they also aren't taught any of the canon in that class, right? So when you read about nuclear weapons, you only read, like your only introduction to that is Carol Cohn's article, right? So you're only reading her like um, anthropological account of this community. Uh, so I, it's hard to say whether or not, you know, it goes back to this question of um, how, what you introduce to people, um, influences the way that they pick things up. Um, the other thing is I've been just Googling around trying to find it. So Ray Atchison put together a really nice reading list that is on the Princeton website that includes, so it was, there's a feminist nuclear network that I'm part of. And she used that network to generate this reading list. But here's the thing, these things get created they go live on the web somewhere and then you can't find them again, right? They can sort of like disappear into the ether. I, what I need to do is get her to somehow post that on Highly Enriched, right? The idea being there's sort of like 
uh, a way where every, so you have to know to find this, that Ray was connected to Princeton, which has the Center on Global Security, and then you have to go find the reading list on their website. Um, but it's a really nice reading list of, if you do want to do uh, something that is bringing in other perspectives on nuclear issues, it's a really nice kind of like compendium just of what is out there to choose from. And it's it's recent. The other thing is that I um, got contacted be, to be part of um, Beyond the Bomb. There's a gal who I think for the first time in a long time, in my mind, made a leap forward in terms of thinking about um, the use of gender in normalizing nuclear issues. And she wrote this little performance piece, which they created a video of called I am a nuclear bombshell in which she anthropomorphizes the bomb as a woman. And it's sort of the first new thing I've seen in a long time. And I use that in my classes frequently. Um, and what the gal who made it did was ask a bunch of female people working in the nuclear space to read the text that she had written. So you have all of these female voices talking about, um, you know, I am a nuclear bombshell. These are all the things that I do kind of thing, right? So it's this sort of like um, ode to female empowerment <laughs> um, that is done in this way that has taking the traditional gendered ideas about um, nuclear weapons and almost turning them on their head. So, uh, you know, I'm always also when we're this question about what texts push students to think, you know, that's the kind of thing I use in the class that I teach on gender and, and, and international issues, um, because it opens up a sort of new way of creating gender dissociations. Um, so there are differences, but it always goes back to, you know, I don't use those things in my international nuclear politics class, because getting the students in that class to be smart on um, gender in a way that they would need to be in order to take those up and understand them and interact with them in a way that would um, um, allow them to do the level of critical thinking that's required of them in the course. It's like, we, we don't have time to teach all the early Cold War history and teach them how to think and talk about gender effectively, right? So those two courses have these really different shapes and they do produce really different outcomes in terms of how the students seem to be oriented on these issues. Right, thank you so much, Anne. And uh, Kartika, you, you emphasize that uh, kind of the, the diverse uh, background of your own students and also some of, um, you know, we've, we've talked about this in a previous seminar, um, I think, on, on race issues and nuclear issues, is that, you know, oftentimes the interest of, um, you know, non, in non-elite, non-wide schools towards things like nuclear policy is very limited because that's associated with the state policy. And oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the underprivileged, um, uh, parts of the society feel like the state has failed them. So there's kind of this negative association a priori that might affect um, the sort of the engagement and the interests of, uh, of students in that. Do you find that in your teaching experience as well? Um, so, so just to make sure that I've understood your question, are you asking whether my students um, in, in classes that deal with nuclear weapons are um, less interested in policy questions. So yeah, so they come with a certain kind of notion that, uh, you know, things nuclear are necessarily the ones that sort of the warmongering state that um, uh, are, is, is sort of perpetuating other, uh, do you find kind of differences in the way or, or a particular set of attitude or is it just basically not on their radar list, uh, sort of on their radar of, of interested things that are they're interested in it at all. Um, well, my so I I only teach uh, majors in political science, so these are students that are very interested in politics. So no, they are actually very. Um, 
much uh, aware of, you know, uh, uh, they are uh, somewhat, uh, mm, they do experience a barrier uh, when it comes to nuclear issues, because as I mentioned, they see them as more um, technical than, you know, issues of, uh, of other, uh, other political issues. Um, I did want to, uh, you know, just listening to all of the excellent points that yes. are that have been made. Um, I I wanted to say something as as an instructor who's been teaching for a long time, um, and I I I, I realize it sort of goes counter maybe to uh, some of the things that have been said, but I feel like I should say this because I'm uh, I want to sort of uh, deter um, feelings of anxiety that maybe some people are feeling. Um, and this actually just goes to something that Anne said. I don't think that we should feel like we have to do everything, right? And we definitely don't have to do everything in any specific course. So whether we have 10 weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks, um, Anne used the, way, uh, the, the phrase, I think, uh, ways of thinking. I think what's really important is to impart ways of thinking um, you don't have to e explain to them how to be feminist. You don't have to, uh, you know, even teach them about specific feminist concepts. You don't even have to really explain to them uh, what MAD is or, you know, the different critiques of MAD. Um, they may not get most of it right away. And I know this may, may seem defeatist, but what I think our role as educators is, is to uh, give them the tools to grapple with it, just as we as scholars are grappling with this enormous concept of, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I think that there's this uh, feeling of anxiety that, oh, you know, first of all, you know, we have to do all of our uh, teaching and service and research. And, and now we also have to be conscious of diversity. And then even within diversity, we have to be conscious of all the different types of diversity. And we have to make sure that our students are as well. I think that it, it leads to sort of this almost paralysis, right? When we walk into the classroom. And I, I just wanna say that what's really important is that we're mindful at, at all the different points while constructing the syllabus, while teaching, but we don't have to feel that we need to convey all of those in every, uh, every single thing that we do. Um, and I think our students are actually far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. I, I know that I have learned a lot from my students. So I uh, grew up in India, I came to the US as a graduate student, um, and I'm very conscious that my position um, in uh, the classroom in American academia has always been as an outsider. A lot of the discourse about race, about diversity is foreign to me and will always remain so because I don't uh, see myself, you know, in those terms that that Americans used to talk about race. Um, and my students have taught me about those those terms and I learned from them as well. And so, you know, I just want to say that um, if anyone in the audience like me is feeling the sense of like, wow, now I have to do this other thing on top of everything else, you know, that's not... Uh, what what I can tell you as someone who's taught for 15 years is uh, please don't feel that this is a burden. The fact that you're here, that you're aware of these uh, facts is going to percolate into your teaching. Um, so um, don't let this spoil your weekend. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much. There's a, a let me just go through through some of the things in the Q and A box. There is a there's a helpful comment from um, Rick Cupid uh, pointing to the IEA a focus on or the uh, conference on international law and uh, a partnership uh, with law schools that would. Um, teach nuclear law um, or, or engage with that sort of creating um, creating or developing that part of the field. Um, uh, there was a comment uh, from a, a, a physicist, a real scientist about the, the sort of presumptions of political scientists to do sort of quote unquote science. It's, it's a actually, you know, an old debate and, and uh, we, we are all, um, we, you know, if anyone would like to con to to take that on and comment um, about sort of limitations of of kind of the claim to universalities of any of these theories, but I think it 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 goes well very uh, it goes very well with what we've been discussing here, just how to historicize, how to show the contingency of a lot of the things uh, that um, uh, that you know a lot of the ways of thinking um, about 
nuclear weapons. Um, the um, Daniela uh, Cafellas is asking, do you have any sources uh, that you would recommend reading about the intersection of race and gender in the nuclear field? Um, I'm sure Highly Enriched has many, uh, and but if you have a favorite or, or really powerful uh, text that you want to recommend, um, uh, please take, um, uh, take that opportunity. Uh, and as you um, sort of choose which one of these to you, you'd like to comment on, um, I, I'd just like to sort of bring to the attention that, that putting together syllabus uh, in a way, at least for me, it was like creating a narrative, right? Um, it's like thinking, how will I tell this story? There's a story to be told there of, of kind of the advent of nuclear weapons into a political and social and economic life of this world. What, how can one tell a story and, and what, a, what Anne said, what, what is the purpose of it, right? What do I want the students in the end to come out with? To, do I want them to, to start thinking about like practical solutions, you know, these are the problems, okay, you guys need to find a solution, go. Or do I want them to actually, you know, ponder to, to understand just how difficult it is, just how many perspectives there are and how, you know, how hard it is to zero in on, on any one answer. So if you could share the experience of the actual putting together of a syllabus, what are some of the things, um, some of some of the aims that you hope uh, your students will, um, will come out at the end of the course. Um, I, I'd be very curious to, uh, to hear about. Um, maybe you, Rebecca, would you like to start? Uh, sure, um, I think that's a good question. I certainly want my students to understand the effects of nuclear weapons, right? And, and what makes them different from other weapons. So that's kind of a bottom line. And we do spend a lot of time looking at different effects, both environmentally on bodies, on communities. Um, so I'd say that's kind of a, a bottom line thing that they need to understand. And then I do want them to know different sides of the debate. So as you were speaking, I was thinking over the course of the semester, my nuclear class, we do have a lot of debates and people aren't, you know, they're not necessarily arguing for what they think, but they have to be very comfortable with the arguments for this side they've been um, assigned and they need to be able to develop counter arguments. And I see, I think that's when people sort of grow intellectually and start to think through. And we do that about the ethics of nuclear deterrence. And we look at different ethical principles. And we do that also for um, if the US should pursue nuclear disarmament as a global policy, not a unilateral disarmament. And so I think um, also simulations, I think are a good time to, for students. So I guess what I'm getting at is like for students being able to think critically and have enough of the knowledge that they're comfortable engaging in that debate as a citizen, um, as a as someone in a class, um, my students who come and know anything about nuclear weapons, it's either like they happen to be someone who's like kind of as a hobby is really into like World War II or military stuff. And I do have a lot of um, uh, former military folks in classes, so they have a particular bent. But it, for for the more traditional college student, it's usually video games that they've learned most about nuclear weapons. So I do try to assess kind of where they learned about it and what they've learned and how that influences their thinking. But um, I just wanted to mention that because I think we've talked about alternative ways that people learn. And I just want to throw out that video games. And I have had students do research projects looking at the way nuclear weapons are used in video games and sort of what message and, and sort of what, yeah, what message they take from that and how that's changed historically. And so that that's just an important point to put out there. But I think just the thing, enough knowledge to think critically, going back to what Aaron said, uh, Anne said earlier on about like they're, they're citizens, right? And so most of my students are not gonna do anything with this, but I want them to know about the modernization plans. I want them to know how much our government is spending on these and what the purpose is. Um, and to, to think both sides of like a disarmament and abolition type of debate. Right. David, um, do you have a comment on that? Um Yes, I think uh, the purpose is, um, I think, to get people to think about the issues, to understand what the different arguments might be or how to weigh up. I mean, the central issue is, you know, 
uh, in a way what to do about nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, but also there are many specific issues to do with uh, specific policy questions. And I don't um, have it generally as my purpose to say, I want people to come out thinking this. Uh, I want people to understand uh, what, at least in, convey what I see um, the issues are and to, to try to grapple with different ways of thinking about them. So ethical ways of thinking, um, policy ways of thinking, um, different perspectives that you could take. Uh, and certainly the, the bottom line is, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, nuclear weapons and um, the enormous um, uh, damage that they can, they, and destruction that they can cause if they are used. Um, I'll give a, maybe a, a somewhat odd example. Um, so I've been teaching in this um, basically summer school nuclear history boot camp for um, 10 years. And I was asked to write something about it, about the, the boot camp in terms of um, um, in terms of the Pope's um, statement that nuclear weapons are forbidden, not just that you shouldn't use them, but that you shouldn't have them, right? And I was writing about the boot camp, and we don't in the boot camp say, this is the kind of thinking you should come out with. It's a very international group with very different perspectives. Uh, actually, wonderfully, I mean, not a big group that meets for two weeks, uh, has met for two weeks. But my um, thought was that what in the end um, contributes to dealing with the nuclear thing is that it is precisely that it is um, graduate students and, and some faculty um, engaged in a two week seminar who are engaged in an issue that they may have to deal with, even if their perspectives are different. So it creates a kind of solidarity and understanding that you know, we're all dealing with this issue, even if our own perspectives are different on it. And so in some sense, uh, that kind of solidarity is what's important rather than people coming away and saying, oh, these are awful weapons. Um, but so, so what comes out of a class? I mean, you can hope it will be one thing and to some degree you have some control over that, but it may be something else. And it's the interactions among the students often that are the, the more important ones. And so, so I prefer seminars to um, lectures in teaching because there, there's more opportunity for interaction. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes um, lecture courses seem to be <laughs> necessary. Um, oh. um, most certainly, I, I'm a huge fan of the nuclear boot camp as a former boot camper myself and i've learned quite a bit from um from the excellent um uh, this excellent program but um and kartika would you would you like to weigh in um i for my specifically nuclear focused courses my hope is that students come away from them being able to um, pick up the newspaper or whatever form that takes for them today. Um, I found out a lot of people read um, Instagram posts about major, major national news events. They get their news from Instagram or um, I work with project assistants on Highly Enriched who um, I, you know, learn firsthand about where they're sourcing their information from them. And then we try to uh, target populations through those same sources. But the idea being, I want people to, you, know, you have them for, um, you know, we also have sort of 10, 11 week semesters and you have them for that amount of time. And you want them, in my opinion, to come away from the course, being able to pick up the newspaper and read about any of the major nuclear challenges. I mean, maybe today that's the um, war in Ukraine and understand uh, the terminology and the issues at stake in a way that they can form their own opinion. Um, and so in that sense, it's very similar to um, what David was saying. It's 
it's not that I ultimately want them to take one position or another, but you know, I want them to be able to feel like, okay, I know enough about this in order to be able to feel like, oh, that's something that's you know, too big for me to, to know. Somebody else makes decisions about that. It's sort of like, no, I know enough about this to understand what's being, what's going on in that debate and what's at stake in it. Um, in the courses that I teach that um, start with issues of gender, um, those courses are also, I think, um, in some ways about, um, I think for me, um, I'm, uh, I'm in a same-sex marriage. Um, the courses that I took in college and in graduate school where I read about feminism, um, um, I read, read queer theory, I read all of those things. Um, those are the things that made it possible for me to come out and live the life that I'm living today. Um, because I didn't grow up in an environment where um, any of that seemed possible, right? So that really was a much more um, personal kind of liberatory journey that I went on through my coursework. And it was sort of like, I learned about these things cognitively first, and then I lived them in my life. And it wasn't until after I graduated with a PhD that I did any of that. Um, so there's also a piece of this that I think is um, helping people understand how to develop those opinions as a person who has um, their own center <laughs> in a way, right? And that's kind of a a larger project that uh, I think educators in, are involved in sometimes whether they know it or not, because frequently the ways in which we uh, are role models for our students are, are in ways that we're not necessarily even aware of. Hi, uh, my deepest apologies. I turned off my video just to step away and close the door because there was somebody mowing the lawn and I can't turn it back on, but I promise I'm here and it is still me. Um, uh, so well, as I'm trying to deal with that, uh, Kartika, do you uh, do you have sort of a narrative uh, that you strive, not a narrative, but what is it that uh, that you might hope the students will uh, will come come out with? Oh, I'm back. oh, you're back. You're back, Mariana. OK, great, great. Yeah, I, I actually found that very interesting. And, uh, you know, we might be role models to our students in ways that we don't recognize. It's kind of a daunting <laughs> thought. <laughs> um, I think I I think I think look like and sound like the moms of many of my students at this point, you know, given uh, given my age now. Um, I don't I don't know that that's a good thing necessarily. Uh, but anyway, so in terms of my goals, you know, that's a, that's actually a really good question. Um, and I think that has evolved um, and it has to do with what I mentioned a few minutes ago. I think initially when I started teaching, my goal was, you know, they need to know about command and control, right? They need to know about the stability instability paradox. Like that is my goal in this module or in this. Um, and I, I actually have given... I, I, okay, I don't want to say given up on that. I think I have moved away from that. Um, I think my goal is more um, for them to kind of pick up these sort of habits of thought, right? So when they see an argument, how do they approach it? How do they identify what political um, motivations might be behind it? Uh, so to not uncritically accept for example, a national security rationale behind an argument and to ask, well, whose interests are being served by making this argument? Uh, but more pragmatically, um, you know, my students, so I only teach undergraduate students, uh, most of them are not going to go on um, and work in um, national security. They're not going to be staffers on Capitol Hill right away. Uh, most of them are not going to go on to grad school, but what they are looking for is to work in government in one way or the other. And so what I try to do, um, I only teach nuclear weapons as a seminar once in about three years. I only get to do that occasionally. Um, and I'm obviously very happy when I get to do that. Uh, and then I teach an international security course um, once a year which I'm doing right now. Um, and in these courses, I have a lot of what I call professional writing. So I teach them to write memos, I teach them to write executive summaries and briefing documents, 
all of which they could use for non-nuclear weapons and non-security related jobs when they go on the job market uh, fairly soon. So most of my, my students are graduating fairly soon. Um, so, so there's a pragmatic aspect to that, but then, you know, being an informed citizen um, and sort of looking at the BS behind the argument is how I like to put it. All very, very good. Um... Uh, kind of goals uh, to have in mind. And indeed, I, I think uh, it, when I was sort of putting together my syllabus, I thought I thought of it this way. I thought, uh, and I might be completely wrong about this, but for me, somehow the late 40s were this kind of big bang uh, of things nuclear where every important concept and movement and idea uh, was born, right? And then it kind of developed uh, and changed and evolved over time. So, you know, deterrence, how that kind of evolved. Uh, disarmament was right there, right then, right? Very early on, uh, international control of nuclear energy, all of these ideas really kind of sprung up together with the nuclear weapons and a lot of the ethical questions uh, that we grapple. But they did, you know, as we kind of kept perusing them um, uh, through, the, through the decades, um, they took new forms and institutional forms eventually uh, and so on. So sort of these various meanings and forms right of that were sprung from from the advent of, of nuclear weapons in the world and i said you i will hope to teach you to think and read critically write concisely and present uh, right i think presentation is one of the skills that um is very daunting for a lot of uh, people, but it's 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 an incredibly um, important. Um, and we are uh, we're almost out of time. And I, I I thank you so much for all the interesting and and really insightful thoughts. And just to wrap up, I it, it struck me that the 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 title of this seminar could have been uh, not just beyond the canon, but beyond the text and beyond the classroom. Right. One thing that came, comes out is that this issue of existential threat, right, one of the very few existential threats, thank goodness for now, that we're facing as humankind is a very niche issue. Very few of us get to even teach a full course in nuclear weapons in the institution that we teach. Uh, sort of this, this huge separation between kind of the monumental importance of the consequences that nuclear weapons bring about in this world and kind of the 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 weight of it in in academia right it's it's a niche issue even within security studies and political science so it it strikes me as you know we are honing these citizens right informed citizens um this is part of a job my my I guess final questions as you reflect and, and wrap things up is how, do, what do we do beyond the classroom, right? The classroom is already a very limited venue. Um, and here we are, we're people who care deeply about, uh, about these issues. Um, what could we do, um, you know, in terms of awareness, in terms of reaching out uh, uh, to more people? And um, I'll go in the reverse order then. Uh, maybe Anne, if you could, um, if you could go first, then. Uh, that's, I, I think, um, if I could answer that question, I'd um, have a lot more money from Carnegie Corporation and other funders, <laughs> because you know this is always the thing that they want um, out of their projects. Um, uh, you know, there's kind of these hard incentives that we have within our field, because the thing that does the most for my career is the kind of thing where you um, can be in a group of scholars, have a conference, do an edited volume, and hope that someday the book comes out in, in paperback, right? Like um, that's best for promotion, like for my personal promotion at work. But what's best for public outreach is actually thinking outside of the box in terms of working with designers, working with web developers, working with people who can create things that can live in this digital world in a way that are easy to pick up and consume. And um, 
So even though it's not necessarily in, like incentivized in terms of um, you know what I would think of as a, a career path that's emphasizing research, you know every everything I choose to do that is more in this realm takes time away from my research. Um, but I decided to become a N Square Fellow, applied to be an N Square Fellow a few years ago. And it's what Highly Enriched came from. And the reason is that we were at the Rhode Island School of Design and we were with this group, uh, interdisciplinary group of people who included engineers um, who could build web pages, right? So all of a sudden we had the opportunity where we had kind of in-house skills in terms of design and, and web development where we could make something new and try it out. And I think that when we think about public outreach, right, there is the path and there's an important piece of our professional obligations that I think are is about um, being a public intellectual in the sense of um, writing our academic work and then um, publishing in blogs and newspapers and doing public facing versions of that. But there's also this increasingly this other piece of um, thinking about where people are, where, where our students generation is going when they're looking for this kind of information and doing the work to figure out how to meet them where they're at, even when that's not necessarily incentivized within our academic institutions. Yes, thank you so much. And that's that's a very important point, like the formats that we are used to, perhaps when we were students or we were, uh, might be irrelevant or might not be the most effective in reaching this, this new generation, right? There's simulations, as we said, gaming, you know, uh, videos and, and all of these new formats that require different kind of skills, even for what we've been trained for. Um, David? Well, yes, I agree with um, uh, those comments and what Anne said, um, but it recalled to me what Kartika had said earlier about, oh, you mean we have to do that as well? And um, so my feeling about this is that the community uh, of scholars needs to take this on, but it's not for everyone to write op-eds and academic articles and appear on, on television and so on. People have different skills and different abilities. Some people are good at explaining things to others. Some people have very interesting ideas, which they're very bad at explaining to people. So I think it's, um, one shouldn't say, oh, I'm, now I'm probably, this is kind of justification of my own activities. One shouldn't say, oh, I should have done all of this. Um, no, I, I have um, a certain set of things that I think I can do. And those are the things which I think fit in and I should do those things. But the community has a responsibility. So the fact that Anne is doing this uh, with, um, enriched uh, and that others are, are making, um, you know, syllabi resources available, uh, archival materials available. There's all kinds of stuff going on that's, I think, uh, acceptable or helpful to researchers. There are people who, who are good at writing books that will reach uh, a, a broad audience, and there are others for whom that's not the problem in a way the primary concern so I think for the community it's very important to be able to do all of these things but I think one shouldn't feel that one has oneself <laughs> on top of uh, you know Kartika's comments about oh we have to do this as well in our teaching and um, to do all of these other things too so um, I, I think uh, and I think that's an interesting choice people have to make am I do I write good op-eds. Writing an op -ed, good op-ed is a skill in itself. It's not the same as writing a, an academic article, and you might be good at one and not necessarily good at the other. And that's not, you know, that probably won't help so much in, in promotion in your, your career, but it's not the same thing. And so one has to realize, you know, what, what is it that I can do that can contribute to this? It's not all on my shoulders to do every bit. So I agree very much with the need um, to make things available on different platforms, and different uh, media. I think that is uh, extremely important. 
Um, but it doesn't mean, I think, that everyone has to do it. I think my point was clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David, what, we'll, I'll clip this recording and have it played for every tenure committee there is. <laughs> <laughs> we could, uh, we could um, have your words of wisdom uh, that could hopefully be imparted to more uh, to more people in charge. Uh, Kartika, would you? Would you like to reflect? Yeah, I I see we are almost out of time. So I just want to uh, say that, you know, uh, I want to say two things very quickly. One is to just echo what David said. And so I'm moving more into administration and governance myself uh, in my career. And I think one of the things that I'm trying to do is to encourage tenure committees to be more open to, you know, what Anne was saying, to um, recognize work um, that is rigorous. Um, and informed by research, but at the same time is not the 30 page, uh, you know, double blind peer reviewed article in uh, one of the top three journals that everyone is supposed to want to publish in. Um, and uh, secondly, and that's actually linked to my second point, which is open access. So I have found that, you know, people are, um, especially those that are not in our field are somehow horrified by the idea that if you don't have to pay in order to read something, then it has no value. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, bizarre to me. So I think that there has to be a, a, a kind of a mindset change in terms of tenure committees, promotion committees um, to understand and, and allow uh, scholars. And I think in spite of that, you know, when you look at the work that Anne is doing, Alex Wellerstein, a lot of uh, people and they're actually doing very well in their professions as well. So it's very heartening to me that we're no longer bound by that sort of, you know, old fashioned notion. Uh, but I'll let uh, Rebecca wrap it up and bring us to the end. Yes. Rebecca? Um, I, I really appreciate what people have said about people kind of finding their niche and doing what they're good at doing. I love talking about nuclear weapons. So, um, you know, I teach about them, but it is, I, I feel like part of my personal kind of goal and mission that people know that, that the public knows more about these issues. And so the way I do that is, you know, a lot of people have world affairs councils in their cities or towns. So I like to give a talk at the world affairs council. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about it to my grandfather's, um, assisted living facility about nuclear weapons. And I think that will be lots of fun. I do note that both of those tend to be on the older side and probably people who already are conscious of nuclear weapons because of their history and because of growing up. So I think one of the big challenges is kind of the middle school, high school age and kind of where, how do we engage with them, whether it's volunteering to talk in a social studies class. Uh, I did, after the Ukraine war started, my third, my daughter's third grade class was really inter interested in nuclear weapons, but the teacher decided that probably wasn't a good thing for me to come in and talk to them in third grade. And I think I agree uh, with her pedagogical assessment there, but I do think that kind of figuring out how to kind of reach younger people, I think is the real challenge and like what Anne is doing and thinking about um, different modes of how, they learn um, is something that we all all need to work more at. But I uh, thank you so much for for doing this, Marianne. I think it's been um, really interesting, really interesting discussion. Well, what made it interesting is your contributions, and we're uh, right on the um, um, on the mark. Whether timing, uh, on behalf of all of us and all the audience, I'm sure. Uh, thank you so much uh, for. Um, for doing what you're doing actually, and for all the, uh, the, the, the efforts that you've put in and teaching and, and thinking about this and, and researching um, and going well beyond that, of course. Uh, and of course, for, for joining us today um, at the seminar, um, um, wish you all the best of luck. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done, it seems, uh, given the, the circumstances out there. Um, and with that, um, a big round of applause to all of you. Uh, and the, the meeting is adjourned, the, uh, the seminars. Thank you. Thank you very much.